So it's good to see you all. It's fall. I had somebody remind me of that today as I walked in the door and they said, you don't have flip-flops on. I said, thank you for reminding me of this. I just told Cheryl this morning, I said, I guess today is the first day that they need to be retired until the spring. Unless we have another trip to Hawaii, right? Is that not always the will of God? <laughs> right? <laughs> so we're going to pick up here uh, in the book of Acts. And um, I hope you've been following along with um, Rob and Jimmy as they've been recording things for you during the week. If you've not been a person that's dug into the word before, I don't know how we can lay this out any better for you. So I really want to challenge you to take your Bibles and begin to dig into the word, not just here on Sunday mornings, but during the weekdays as well. All right, it's all provided for you there. So as you know, we're in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is one of my very favorite books. When I was a young man with Youth of the Mission, from when I was 18 to 25, we actually named our ministry Acts 2. And so from a very early age, we jumped into that, and we were seeing Acts 2 kind of experiences happen on the high schools of, uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii, where God was showing up, meeting students. Cheryl and I, just being there in August, we had a real opportunity to rub shoulders with some of those very same people who came to know the Lord 44 years ago. Jesus wants to do a work of Acts. Before he does it in the body, he wants to do it in you and me. He wants to do a fresh work. Like now is the time to lean into God like you've never leaned into him before. And I wanna challenge you to do that. It's an important time for us to do that. So if you haven't heard this before, and look here at Acts 1-8 with me, but Acts 1-8 provides us with the overview of the book of Acts. So I'm just giving you the 40,000 foot level here for a minute. So it says this, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has a come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the end of the earth. And so as you're reading through Acts, just note this. This will help you to kind of have context. Chapters one to seven are all in Jerusalem. Chapters eight to 12 are in that middle part, Judea and Samaria, where the gospel begins to go outside of Jerusalem. And then chapters 13 on to 28 is the end of the earth. So as you're reading through Acts, just kind of remember that. Chapters 1 to 7, Jerusalem, 8 to 12, Judea, Samaria, 13 to 28, the ends of the earth. That'll help you kind of see where you are. So if you followed this week's lesson from uh, pastors Rob and Jimmy, you notice that we read out of Acts chapter 5. And it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And it's a pretty heavy-duty story. Somebody comes in to give a donation and they leave dead. And then the wife comes in and, hey, did you give this much? Yeah, we did. Uh, you'll be buried next to your husband. Like that, that's your last words that you hear and you're gone. And it says this, and fear, not, not afraid, running away fear, but the fear of the Lord showed up upon the church. We're going to take a look at this today, but, but, but pick up with me here. We're going to read quite a bit today. Acts chapter 5, Verses 12 to 42, it says this. Now many signs and wonders regularly done, were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. It's because of that fear of the Lord that was there. So even the world around them was like, whoa, there's something more here. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they even carried out the sick into the streets, laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Like, this is an amazing thing. Somebody's sick, hey, just let's get him out here. So it's just, hey, I heard Peter's walking by at three, and just as, boom, his shadow fell falls on them, and they're healed. Like the power of God, based in the fear of the Lord, is doing an incredible thing there in Jerusalem. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But 
During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Like, you just got set free from prison with a little assignment, right? When we get to chapter 12, you'll notice it's hilarious because Peter is sleeping so sound in the prison, the angel has to nudge him. Like, could you imagine? All right? So now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked, the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Could you imagine the fun they would have had that night? Like I wonder if they walked through, you know, could you imagine walking through the prison door and going, let me do that again, you know? And just, because they open and, and they're not there. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told, look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went, brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, like you wonder if he just didn't go, like, how did you guys do that, right? But it's here it says, we strictly charged you to not teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, by hanging him on a tree. Peter just goes, yeah, it was you whom you killed and hung him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. So he's probably calming them all down. And then he says this to them, men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theotis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able, be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Hello. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council. Now, this is one of my favorite verses in all of Acts, and may it be one day that we live up these words, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Like, they weren't pity parting. They weren't, woe is me. People are picking on me. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. And every day, in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Wow. We need to see those kinds of things happen in our day. But it only happens through the church if we walk in the ways of God that he's taught us. It's not gonna happen if I just show up on Sunday mornings. Mm -mm. There's a lot more to it. It's pursuing God with all our hearts. So here in chapter five, we, we encounter this sense of the fear of the Lord with Ananias and Sapphira. And it says to us there in verse 11, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. So it wasn't just the church, but it was the people around. It was like, whoa, did you hear what happened? The fear of the Lord shows up. We see it here again in verse 29 where it says, we must obey God rather than men. The fear of the Lord. But I just want to show you how this pattern, and we won't hit all of them, but I'm going to, I just want to show you how this continues throughout the book of Acts because the community of God, the people of God, the church, functioned in this. 
The leadership, every decision that was made by leaders was made not with the fear of man and what people are gonna think or pleasing somebody. It was made in the fear of the Lord. So just look at some of these. Here in Acts 9, 31, this is shortly after Paul, who you know, was Saul, becomes Paul, joins the church. Look what it says in Acts 9, 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Wow. As they continued to walk in the fear of the Lord, the Lord did things to them. How about Peter? The next chapter, chapter 10, the story of Cornelius. It's describing this non-Jew in this way. Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. That's a story you'll learn about shortly. But but an angel directed Peter to go to this Gentile's home who was a God-fearing man. And while he was in his home and Peter spoke, he said this, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He's pointing out that, hey, though this guy's not a Jew, he's a Gentile, he fears God. God is for him. Paul, while preaching in Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13, says this. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. He's highlighting those who fear God. Then he goes on that same message, brothers Sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. And so we're seeing this highlighting of people who fear God or the invitation for them to hear. And then we run into this story. This is my last one I'm gonna show you for this morning. Acts 19, verses 14 to 20. When Paul encounters some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists who undertook to invoke the name of Jesus over those who had evil spirits. It shows us the power of the name of Jesus in us, not when you try to claim it when he's not in you. Check this story out. Talk about the fear of the Lord coming into someone's life on this. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them when they were trying to cast them out in the name of Jesus without being followers of Jesus. Check this out. The evil spirit answered, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who the heck are you? The heck was, it's really there in the Greek. No, all right. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Now look what happened as a result of this. Also, many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Heavy duty stuff. But the king of kings advancing his kingdom forward. Nothing will get in the way of that. Nothing. He will move forward. Now, it's interesting when you, you don't know uh, if it's drachmas or denarii or what the silver coins were, but, but they said it, that could have been upwards of the, the equivalent of today, $5 million worth of product burned because the fear of the Lord had come upon them all. You guys, when the fear of the Lord comes upon you, you pause. Like, like, let me just ask you a question. When was the last time you were just bowed before the Lord with the fear of the Lord resting upon your life? You see, this has been chased from our culture and it's been chased often from the church. As a young man, 18 to 25, with Youth of the Mission, I had teachers that taught me about the fear of the Lord. I had those that discipled me, made sure as an 18, 19, 20-year-old, that this became a core part of my spiritual foundation. And they began to shape me, along with many other things, but at the core, also the fear of the Lord. All right? And so I want to talk with us about, about this today, because 
in my own journey, it began to affect every motivation. Because now if my motivation was like I was, a, I was a missionary, and so part of being a missionary was raising funds. And so the Lord would check my motivations. Are you just meeting this person because of the money part, or are you sincerely caring about them first? The fear of the Lord goes after the motives of your heart. It began to surround my words. There were times I wanted just to say something, and it was like, because I had prayed, Lord, would you give, the, give me the fear of the Lord on my mouth? Would there be like a little sentry that marches like this in front of my mouth that will not allow things that are not of you to come out of this little mouth? It began to impact my actions. And you guys, I'm telling you, I'm not walking around in fear. I'm walking around knowing that I will give an account for my life. Sometimes in the midst of a, a ball game this afternoon and we're eating and yes, we enjoy that and family, I'll be the first one to enjoy that. But we also have to recognize that day in and day out, the way that we're living our lives or not counts. It counts. Like all of us one day will be like this before the Lord. Nobody, hey, help me out. No. No. We have to realize that day is coming. It is assured. Do we live in the sense of the fear of the Lord? And I'm going to give you a definition here in a minute of what that means. But do we live that way? It also began to teach me how to walk under authority. We live in a culture today that just thinks we can pop off at authority figures whenever we want. That is not God's ways. If there's wrongdoing, there's a right way to approach that. But I remember the story, and, and you know, it's in the book of Numbers, where Miriam, Moses' own sister, begins to nanny, 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 about Moses, and all of a sudden she's struck with leprosy. It's an image, and you say, well, I've never been struck with leprosy, maybe not physically. Do we realize that if you're going to break God's ways of doing things, there's consequences? And it might not look like it plays out in the Bible. It might not appear physically, but spiritually, I wonder how many of us may be leprous. Yes, we love Jesus. Yes, we're going to heaven. But my effectiveness of living my life is not there. The way we're to walk under authority appropriately. Are there times we're supposed to push? Yes, but there's a way to do it in a godly way. And it usually has nothing to do with firing arrows on social media. It impacted how I viewed people. Like, like do you realize that person that irritates the snot out of you right now or that you're kind of not in the right place with? Right? Do you understand that they are born in the image of God and the blood of Jesus has been shed for them? Therefore, they're worthy of being treated with value. When you walk in the fear of the Lord, you see everybody that way, regardless if they're like you or unlike you. How about the fear of the Lord in the way we relate to people, when we just blow people off? See, the fear of the Lord impacts much of our lives, the way we view things and the way we do things. So let me introduce you a little bit more clearly because of the centrality of the fear of the Lord in the community of, of Acts to what it is. So what I want to do is give you a little working definition, and then I want to give you three ways that a Jew at the time of the book of Acts would have understood the fear of the Lord because it helps make it real practical for us. So here's a little definition for you. The fear of the Lord is reverencing and referencing God in all that I do. Say that with me, would you? reverencing and referencing God in all that I do. That's the fear of the Lord. It's reverencing him. He's God and I'm not. And it's referencing him, not moving in the sin of presumption, but it's referencing him, his word, the Holy Spirit, what he's speaking to you. Otherwise, we're moving in presumption. If we just go and take a job without asking God about it, that's called presumption. He's the only one that can see down the road. He's the only one that knows the details of it. And he invites us, seek me, seek me, see me. Come on, I want to tell you, I want to give you my wise counsel. But instead what we do is we get presumptuous. We don't ask the Lord, and then we ask God to bless it. Do you know there's nowhere in the Bible 
where we just initiate something on our own and ask God to bless it, and he does. It doesn't work that way. The way it works is we seek God, he shows us what to do, and as we obey, he blesses. What God initiates, he permeates. What I initiate, I have to sustain. Folks, hopefully already within our hearts today, there's things, boy, I need to repent for some things. And then, and then when it doesn't go well, we're doing this. God, how did you? He said, I didn't. You did. The fear of the Lord keeps us from presumptuous sin by asking him what he's saying. Reverencing and referencing God in all that I do. So let me give you two pieces that have to do more with the reverencing side. And I'm gonna give you one piece that has to do with the referencing side. So, first of all, the first thing I wanna tell you about reverencing is this, the fear of the Lord is taking God seriously. The fear of the Lord is taking God seriously. In other words, he's not the man upstairs. It's taking God seriously for who he is. Let me just remind us who he is. Look at Isaiah 40 with me. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or who, what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations, notice with an S, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are counted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth his emptiness. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, the stars. By the greatness of his might and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. We've got to remember who it is we're dealing with. Reverencing God means taking God seriously. Do you take him seriously? Do you take him at his word? When you read his word, is it, oh, it's another option for me to consider, or is it the word of the Lord to you? Stuff we have to look at. It is the recognition that God is God and I am not. That's part of taking God seriously. Moses encounters God at the burning bush and the ground becomes holy. What's his response? He bows. Isaiah sees a vision of heaven where God is holy, 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 and he becomes undone. The word there means disintegrated. And John in the book of Revelation sees Jesus, and it tells us in Revelation 1, he becomes like a dead man. When was the last time in worship, when was the last time in your prayer life, when was the last time just being in the word before the Lord that you came to that place of recognizing you are God and I am not? We need to rediscover this. The fear of the Lord. Here's some other pieces on this piece of taking God seriously. Our obedience to God is directly related to how much we fear the Lord. Let me just say something to you. When you think you have a disobedience problem, it's not a disobedience problem. It's a lack of the fear of the Lord problem. Because friends, it becomes a ridiculous thought when you walk in the fear of the Lord to disobey God. 
Let me show you something. You might know this story, Genesis chapter 22, 11 and 12. This is just as Abraham is about ready to plunge the knife into his son Isaac. And look what happens. The angel of the Lord calls to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Look what he says. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. The fear of the Lord is what is the root of obedience because it becomes a ridiculous thought to disobey the righteous one. Huge. We've got to get this, gang. As we walk in God's ways in Scripture, the fear of the Lord impacts our attitudes, our actions, our words. How about this? Like, just, just listen to me a minute here. Where have we cheated Where have we cheated in business, on taxes? Cheated our family? Where have there been half-truths? Where are the things done and said behind someone's back that you would never say in front of them? Do you see how far we have drifted from the fear of the Lord? We could just go, you know, I know there's supposed to be some inspection in our home before we put this in, but if, if we live higher in the country, if nobody knows, what's the harm? That is a lack of the fear of the Lord. You might say, well, Dave, this is legal. No, it's not. It's God's ways. It's what the church in Acts floated upon. If we want to see the end results of Acts, we got to see these results first in us. As the people of God, as families, and as the community of God. The fear of the Lord, my friends, is important to God. When we see God for who he really is, which moves us to take him seriously, it becomes ridiculous, a ridiculous thought to disobey him. Listen listen to this, Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So when you look at a land, no, just pick a nation, ours. (laughs) And you wonder what's going on. It's easy math for me. A lack of the fear of the Lord means there's no wisdom. And we are out of control because there's not wisdom. And so you can do the easy math. Wisdom, no wisdom means no fear of the Lord. And folks, this begins with us, the people of God. And then the people of God being placed in strategic places places in our land that could lead with wisdom whose characters back it up. Think about that in family life, in church life, in government. Okay, let me give you the second expression here of reverencing God. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. This is what it says in Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. God has absolutely no tolerance for sin. Does he love the sinner? Absolutely. Did he love him so much that he sent his son to die that we might be reckoned? Absolutely. But we have to understand, just just read Revelation 4 and 5. It's it's my go-to place when I need a freshening up of the fear of the Lord. Because in heaven, all the time, they're bowing, saying, holy. Like, do you understand there's angels that are assigned? The only job they have in heaven is holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it's not an assignment that, boy, I I hope we get a break. It's because they're seeing who he really is and they can't help but do that. Check this out. This is going to get a little pointed now. To the degree we fear the Lord is the same degree we hate sin. I'm not there yet. I don't hate sin like I want to. The way that I have learned to hate it more and more is because of my role in people's life oftentimes. I'm the one they're doing this, is they're crying on my shoulder, I'm sitting, and I hear all the horrific stuff that has happened to him. That has caused me to learn to hate sin. But I'm not here yet where I need to be. But the fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Check this out, how about this? We are only as holy as our thought lives are holy. Do you understand that our thoughts echo in heaven as loud as our words do here on earth? The first time I ever heard that, I was shaken to my core. 
Like I want you to imagine that every thought that you have is thrown up on a screen like this in heaven for everybody to see right now. We are only as holy as our thought lives are holy. I'm not talking about our righteousness in Christ. We are righteous in Christ. But now it's working that righteousness out into the real life of our hearts and minds. Do you have a guard on this? Or is, or is it like a free-for-all? Is it like a playground that the enemy goes, let's go play in his head? Let's go play in her head? Or are you watching your thought life? Like, just try to do this tomorrow. Take 24 hours from when you get up to when you go to bed and try to manage your thought life. Just watch. Just watch everything that goes on there. If you begin to do that and say, Lord, I invite you into this because obviously I can't do this. I need you by the power of your spirit to help me with my thought life. We are to have the fear of the Lord on our tongues. Look at what it says in Psalm 34. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Like you guys know, right? The Bible tells us that we're gonna give an account for our words. And yet we're living in a day that's not only like this, it's words like this too that are all over the place. We're lacking the fear of the Lord on our mouths. The Bible actually tells us there are times that it's more wise to keep your mouth shut. And yet we live in a culture, and, and so it shows you how we've been discipled by our culture to think that I need to know everything about everything. Do you realize some of the damage that has been wrecked on you? Because you had to know everything about everything and now you're wrestling with this and that person and what they're like and what do I... The fear of the Lord over our minds, over our mouths. The, the other thing today, too, I just posted something on this because a friend did and I thought, this is a good word. I'm not a big poster, but this is one I did. It's like, I don't understand why cussing has now become the cool Christian thing to do. It's not... It's not. It doesn't make you bigger, doesn't make you stronger. Matter of fact, the crassness of it makes people look at you less, and none of that reflects Jesus. So let's kind of get over this cool Christian thing to do to cuss like the world does. We're not supposed to be like the world. Come on, people of God. We are to have the fear of the Lord in how we view those around us and how we relate to people. Like, like I mentioned this a few moments ago, but do you have the fear of the Lord on how you view people? Do, do you just toss people away? I mean, we're, we got our cancel culture, right? So I don't like what they said, so I just cancel them. Guys, that's not godly. Matter of fact, sometimes the person that's saying the opposite has been brought into your life to stop you to just to think more holistically about it. And sometimes so that you can relate to where they are so you know how to help them get maybe where they need to be. But if we don't, guys, that, that's not functioning God. That's not walking in the fear of the Lord. We got to walk in the fear of the Lord in our relationships. Those people are made in the image of God. We got to walk in the fear of the Lord in maintaining unity. Like, like Ephesians tells us that we've been, we already have unity in the spirit, but our job is to maintain it. And that's a precious thing. And one of the reasons we see the church in Acts be the church in Acts is because they maintained the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. They did everything necessary in their relationships to keep unity where it needed to be. Huge. It's huge. How about this one? We are to walk in the fear of the Lord in the way we relate to those in authority. Some of you, just because we've all been hurt by authority, but some of you have not dealt with that hurt. And therefore, it's screw you if, if someone's in authority. You can't tell me what to do. Can I just tell you that's not a godly attitude? You need to let Jesus heal your heart. Don't mishear me. There are times that we need to stand against, just like they did. We're not going to fear man. We're going to fear God. That's why we're going to go out and still proclaim the gospel. But guys, that's proclaiming the gospel. 
we try to attach this big, you know, macho thing on every topic we just feel like is our pet topic. We've got to learn that God is the ultimate authority. So when he asks us to do something, it's yes, sir. It's my privilege to serve you. And unless we deal with this attitude of heart, we're going to be stuck over and over and over and over and over again. I've been hurt by authority. And you know, we're not dumb. Once you've been hurt by authority, it's kind of like, well, I'm going to check this out. But it's the attitude inside of, God, I'm yielded to your authority. I mean, even Jesus, hey, Peter, go catch that fish. There's going to be a coin, pay our taxes. I mean, he didn't say, forget Caesar, I ain't paying my tax. He didn't do that. You got to look in the word on this stuff, folks. Let me give you the third one here. So we got reverencing God and referencing him. Here's referencing. The fear of the Lord leads to seeking God in everything. So remember I said to you, this is how the Jewish people, the Hebrew mindset of the Old Testament, and then at the time of the book of Acts, this is how they viewed the fear of the Lord. Okay? There was this reverencing part, he's God and I'm not. They took God seriously. They also viewed reverencing God as the fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. And then there was this third piece of referencing him. The fear of the Lord leads to seeking God in everything. Those who fear God reference him in their daily lives and everything they do. It, that, this is what it means to walk in the spirit. Yes, we are in the word, and then when we leave the word and we have to get up and go, we're to live that word and we're to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But it leads to seeking him. Like again, you guys, what's the opposite of seeking him? It's the sin of presumption. I've had to repent of this many times. That I've presumed these things that God wanted me to buy this or do this or go there or whatever. Can I just encourage you? There's, there's a place of repentance of saying, God, forgive me. I've been presumptuous. I, I, you know, you heard me say this a couple weeks ago when I, I think I was doing communion. I said this to you that... It's an old saying, but it needs to be refreshed. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. We're not just churchgoers, people. We are the people of God that are to be a loving force in the world. But we've got to get aligned to God. And a part of this is rediscovering the fear of the Lord. Those who fear God avoid the sin of presumption. They avoid doing things without referencing God. This means, yes, seeking God in prayer. It means getting good counsel, wise counsel from the scriptures, through people and through being in the word. What's the opposite of all this? The fear of man. The fear of man. To serve God, one must place Excuse me, to serve God, one must place no other gods before him. Concerned more for man's reactions than God's reactions indicate a greater respect for man than for God. Rather than a righteous fear of man, this represents an unholy fear of man. Now listen to this. The fear of man is present when we determine what we will or won't do based on anything other than God's truth and his leading in our lives. We live in a culture that not only fears man, but we are bound to it. The fear of man is when, well, I wonder what their opinion's gonna be versus what is God's opinion on it. Sure, when I get God's opinion on it and I know I need to share something with someone, then I take it to that next of God, how would they best receive that? Right, appropriate. But when you can't get out of a group of people that are tearing you down or you can't do that, guys, we're, we're stuck in the fear of man. And look what it says, Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear of the Lord, or excuse me, the fear of man leads to people pleasing and the fear of man hinders our obedience to Jesus. The fear of man. Now, in my notes, I don't have a slide on these, but in my notes, if you download them from online, I have a list for you of 19 or 20 scriptural promises to those who fear the Lord. Things like fruitfulness, blessings on us and our children, prolonged days, guidance, 
the confiding of God. I love Psalm 25, 14. It says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. In other words, God doesn't share secrets with those that don't fear him. The secret of the Lord, the confiding of God, the, the counsel of God is with those who fear him. And on and on it goes. And you can look at that if you want to download that online. So, so let me just close today by, by just saying, gang, we got to get back to reverencing and referencing God in all that I do. And I just want to give us an opportunity. We just need to head out of here in about three, four minutes. But, but this is a moment I don't want you to miss. It's like, respond to the Lord this morning. If you're hearing some of this and you're going, and I know some of you might go, yeah, but Dave, I don't have, there's not enough time. Before you go to bed tonight, go on a walk, get on your knees, and Repent. Repent where you've not feared God and where you've feared man. Repent in those places where you've not referenced him. You've not rep, you know, referenced him either. It's just, I just go about making my decisions and because I'm a son in the house, a daughter of the most high, I'm just asking him to bless it. It doesn't work that way. That might be one of the biggest things you heard today because some of you are going, now I know why it's not working. Would you stand with me? As Jonathan plays, I just want you to stand before the Lord this morning. Our thought lives. Do we understand our words echo in heaven? Or excuse me, our thoughts echo in heaven as loud as our words do on earth. How's the thought life? How about our words? Can, can I just exhort you, just right now, just if, you, if there's any place inside of you where the Holy Spirit did that little thing he does with his elbow inside of us or the thing he does where he touches us inside of conviction, I just want to encourage you right now, just go there. Just repent. Repentance means I agree with what God has said even about me. Not only that you're his son and that you're his daughter, but on these kinds of things. Lord, I'm aligning with you. And if you're wondering today, how do I get the fear of the Lord? Two things I would recommend to you is, is take your Bible and go through, get a concordance and go through the times it talks about the fear of the Lord. Take these notes and review them several times. Again, you can just download them off the website. But then here's, here's how you do it, is you ask the Lord for it. God, would you give me the fear of the Lord today and invite him and just watch, he will do it. He will do it. You'll be ready to say something and all of a sudden you'll catch yourself. That's awesome. That means you, he's acting on your behalf. There may be a deep motive of your heart that he's exposed this morning. That's his goodness to you. When you go into something with a wrong motive and he does the poking, just say, Lord, thank you that you're my, and, and uh, repent. Like, like embrace the weakness of that. Repent and surrender that to him and say, God, I'm just asking you to come and fill me up with the fear of the Lord. There'll be a man, a woman that fears God above all else. So Lord, as we've kind of assigned some homework today, you've assigned to us to take a look at our own hearts. Are we reverencing you above everybody and everything? Are we reverencing you even above our own will and what we want? Are we referencing you throughout our day, throughout our life, that Lord, we might walk in the fear of the Lord? So Lord, today I just pray that as we leave this place, you would allow the sober-mindedness of this to find its rightful spot inside of us and that you would carve out time for us in these next hours and days to have time with you. Thank you for the blessing of the fear of the Lord that allows us to walk in peace, our families to flourish, that, that we'd have confidence in God and the confiding of God. 
Lord, help us to have fresh vision to walk in that way in our lives. So if you'd all just look up here at me. So do your homework, however God would lead you on this. Let me just pray out with this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the precious flock of Grace Chapel said, amen. 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 Go in peace.